Uh, my name is Vicky. I work for the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, um, which is lovely. Um, so as Mari was just saying there in the introduction, we're a five year project. So we do come to an end next year. Um, we work across a huge area of Scotland. We actually cover about a third of Scotland that you can see on the map there. Um, right down from Perth at the bottom, right up to Durness in the north corner. So Inverness and Bewley, smack bang in the middle of the map there, where you guys are obviously. And the aim of the project is to work at a local level um, with partners and volunteers to establish community-based invasive non-native species management. So we're trying to train people up in the local community, infuse people, engage people, help them get qualifications and things like pesticide application. So when the project finishes next year, there'll still be folk based in the community or an angling club or a, a land manager or a farmer that can carry on some of this work that we've started um, rather than just going out and doing it all ourselves. So we'll soon see whether that's gonna work or not. Um, we work with a lot of partners, so we're not just a small team, we're only a small team of sort of five staff, but we work with all the fishery trusts in the area, so uh, everyone covering uh, about 40 different river catchments and the University of Aberdeen. So that's the Ness and Bewley Fisheries Board um, in your area, where some of you are, uh, Six Bay Fishery Board down here, and Marissa Finton and Lossie, all these catchy titles everyone has. Um, and Nature Scott is our main second funder, along with the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund, who are mainly funded through lottery money. So in terms of what we do, we have three strands to our project. Um, we control one animal, which is the American mink. So we monitor for and trap uh, American mink, which is um, probably, as you know, it comes from America. Um, as the, the main predator of water bowls and things. And we do that with these rafts, the people monitor looking for footprints on these rafts and then we can put traps on if we know we've got mink present in an area. We control just a very key set of species of invasive plants, so riparian species, ones that grow alongside the river, which are just the big ones, the, the kind of main three, giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, the Himalayan balsam, and then a couple of others, American skunk cabbage and white dotted burr. And then we do some work to raise the education, uh, work with schools and awareness raising work. Um, like we used to stand in tents at shows, but now we just talk online uh, to tell people what invasive species are and what they can do to help and things. But what I thought I'd talk about more tonight is just in general terms, rather than tell you too much about our project. Um, but if people want to know more about how we do what we do, I'm happy to go into that at the end as well. So in terms of invasive non-native species, uh, they can be anything. They can be plants, they can be trees, birds, insects, animals, amphibians, bivalves, any, any type of species. We have all different types in, in Great Britain and they're found in all habitats as well. So we've got them on land, terrestrial ones, we've got them in freshwater and we've got them in the sea as well. We've got them in the marine environment. So these little nesties really are everywhere, they take every form. So in terms of a few definitions to get us going, um, you might know a bit about invasive species, I don't know. Um, Non-native species, we also use the term alien species and or introduced species, are plants and animals that have been transported outside of their natural range um, by humans. And that's a critical point and it's always been by humans, um, either accidentally or intentionally, whereas a native one is obviously one that's always grown and lived in a place. And in Great Britain, that's taken to be the end of the last ice age. So about 9,000 years ago, we still had the land bridge to Europe and there was a free movement of species between Europe and Britain and across the continent. And as the ice retreated and became an island, anything that's come to Britain since that point is generally considered a non-native species. And it's been brought here in some format by man or by humans, by people. So in terms of non-native species, there's over 3,000 in Great Britain of which 2,000 are established and by established we mean things that are growing successfully or breeding or they've adapted to our climate and they're successful here and they've established themselves, they're reproducing, they're carrying on and growing. Another term that's quite often thrown around is naturalised, um, which is a term some people use for a non-native plant or animal that's become established and people quite often use this term and say oh no it might have been here for quite a long time we'll call it naturalized it's okay it belongs now but other purists will say they're always classed as non-natives um, things like the rabbit people forget a rabbit is actually non-native it's brought in under debate but some people say the romans some say the normans it's been here a long long time but technically 
it's still a non-native, but a lot of people refer to it as naturalized. And most of these non-natives do no harm. Um, they're completely harmless, a lot of them. And it's only a minority of them, about 10%, that go on um, to have negative impact. In terms of invasive, the word invasive, we mean something that has the ability to spread and cause significant negative impacts. And those impacts are either to the environment, which are the ones we most often hear about, but also the economy or directly to our health or the way we, we live. Um, and they can be native or non-native. And this is where it starts scrambling with your brain a little bit. So if you think about the example I usually use is bracken. Bracken is a native fern to Great Britain. Well, it's um, quite often invasive species. A lot of people do work to remove bracken because it's a problem plant. You know, it's taking over in a lot of places and it's preventing native stuff growing. It's causing problems on farms. So that's an example of an invasive native species. But nearly always um, invasive non-native species, the big problem cause of invasive species are the non-native ones. And they're the most successful ones in their new locations. So we've got these non-native ones that have come over and generally it's because they haven't evolved alongside our native species. They tend to be much more successful at growing here. So <clears throat> just looking at why they're more successful, um, a lot of traits that animals have in terms of why they become invasive are shared across all species. So when we think about examples, that's things like a lack of predators. Um, they don't get diseases. They don't have competitors. So things there like the New Zealand flatworm there, it's a pretty horrible distasteful worm so none of our bird species eat it so it's got no predators to keep its population in control. It's a horrible thing anyway. Um, animals tend to be aggressive and bold, the little Asian hornet in the corner there, they will kill our um, native bees so it's a really nasty species if we're going to get that here. They tend to be generalist um, in that they'll eat quite a varied diet, we, I think a lot of us have heard about the problems of squirrels um, they'll eat a lot of a lot of food, a lot of um, unripened food before our red squirrels are a little bit more picky and they're very adaptable in terms of the habitats they'll live in, things like the mink, um, it's a semi-aquatic animal but it'll live in a lot of different habitats and they tend to be highly mobile and good at dispersing so they'll spread quite easily through the country um, and that will live in, like I say, a lot of places. Mink especially, they can travel up to 80 kilometres from the site they were born in just to look for a good breeding ground. And in terms of plants, um, the characteristics we see are common across a lot of the plants that have become invasive. So they grow very early in the year. Um, you've probably not noticed, unless like us, you go around spending an awful lot of time peering at giant hogweed plants. But quite often we spot in little seedlings, even in this part of the country from the highlands, um, in February, March time, we've seen them start to grow. So by the time we hit spring, you've already got kind of a foot wide leaf, which is dominating a, a percent above the native vegetation as that's starting to come out. So they grow quite early in the year. They grow very vigorous, a lot of them get very, very big. Um, Jack, who stood next to that hogweed plant there, Jack, Jack's near on six foot um, and he's just looking tiny next to that big plant. And not just the height, but the leaf, the size of the leaves on a lot of these invasive plants are like, you know, twice the size of dinner plate, two or three meters big. Um, so they, they completely take over in terms of shading. Most plants also have very abundant seed numbers, which makes them very successful. So like the giant hogweed plant there can produce on average, I think it's about between 20 and 30,000 seeds per flower head. So just that one flower will have 30,000 seeds on it. And they can uh, both disperse in the wind and they can float on water. So it's very easy for it to spread its seeds. The Himalayan balsam I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's got those lovely um, bursting seed pods. So when the seed pods ripen at the end of the summer, slight breeze or a little touch or a knock and the pods explode and they can fire the seeds as the seeds explode, the pods explode, sorry, for about seven metres from the plant. So it's very successful in um, dispersing its seeds. Or if not seeds, um, a few of the species we deal with, like Japanese knotweed, have a really big, strong, robust underground rhizome um, type root, which is really difficult to, to work on over the years and get rid of. It's almost impossible to dig out. They just go on for about seven metres laterally under the soil. Plants tend to be very adaptable again as well. They can grow in a number of habitats. That's the little giant hogweed plant um, growing in a car park in Elgin. Um, and they can grow in a range of conditions. And again, because they've not evolved here, because they're not native, they don't have any pests or diseases. 
And I've popped that picture in in the bottom right hand corner there, which is a picture of rust fungus on Himalayan balsam. And the rust fungus is one that's just being tested at the moment and it's been brought over from um, from the Indian Himalayas where the um, uh, Himalayan balsam is native. So we've actually now had to bring a, a non-native fungus in which is attempting to then be released onto the Himalayan balsam in England and Scotland to then you know uh, attack it and, and try and kill it and control it that way. But when you start thinking about this it's just getting absolutely crazy there's nothing here naturally that no pest or disease that will attack it so we're now we're bringing them over from India to attack it as well and those trials started I think they've been about 10 years in England um, it took them a lot longer to get a license in Scotland um, so I think they've been in since about 2016 it was first released down in the Scottish borders and it's all under test conditions at the moment um, and in terms of the impacts these invaders are all really really successful obviously um, and we see a lot of um, really worrying impacts that the invasive species, invasive non-native species cause. The primary, the primary ones are environmental impacts and again I've split these into plants and animals. The main one that they cause is biodiversity loss. Um, they're one of, on a worldwide scale, they're one of the top five drivers of biodiversity loss worldwide up there with climate change and pollution and um, exploitation of resources and habitat degradation and the fifth one is invasive species so they really are quite quite destructive in what they do. So they outcompete native plants. Um, the picture there is white butterbur which is one it's actually quite a bit of it around Inverness and Bewley. Um, it tends to be found predominantly in the UK in the northeast of Scotland. It's been really bad in Aberdeenshire and some of the tribu tributaries of the River Spey um, filling but quite badly. But I think there's quite a few bad sites um, near Bewley as well. What's the botany? Oh, yeah, has, yeah. As you can see there as it, the leaf comes out before yeah. the flower and it just forms an absolute well, it's enough. It. It's right. you just can't if see want to or not. anything underneath it at all and not even little that that site's on the river Fiddick and we're seeing not even any tree saplings are growing up there anymore it's just completely dominated uh, by the white butterbur so as well as out competing plants they can alter the habitats disrupt the ecosystems you get different insects coming in, you get different small mammals. There were, there were 15 people at the beginning of watching. Uh, uh, 15. The, one of the other impacts they can have um, environmentally is to attract bees, Himalayan balsam. Um, so I'm just if you're aware, it's a really good pollinator. Um, so it attracts bees away from native flowers. The bees will travel hundreds of metres to um, reach the balsam. They, they sense it and travel to see it. But then it then means they're not pollinating our native flowers and it's not actually good for the bees either because bees need um, a lot of different types of nectar they get a little bit different protein from every different nectar and instead they're just getting one protein from all this um, Himalayan balsam which is actually not good for the bees. Some of the other impacts we're seeing is a bank erosion uh, this is so you can't see the label there Japanese knotweed down in the corner and as it decays and dies back and we see it especially with balsam as well being an annual plant when we when balsam dies back in the winter we see this quite a bit that we get loose banks and soil and especially if there's been flooding as well we see a lot of soil coming into the water and that can affect salmon spawning and all sorts of other knock-on effects or blocking ditches burns and flooding further downstream and another I've added on the end there another slight kind of impact from biodiversity terms is that we are at the moment being Forced, almost forced to use an awful lot of chemicals in the countryside to actually deal with these plants which is not great for the environment either but lesser of two evils almost. And the impacts that we're seeing from, um, oh, sorry, on animals, the environmental impacts we see there tend to be direct things on our mammal species, um, or animal species, sorry. So we see a lot of predation and the American mink is really um, a classic example there. Um, American mink have predated extremely heavily on water bowls um, to the point the water bowl population in, in Great Britain reduced by um, I think it's 94 percent because of predation and again that's bringing in a non-native species that's not evolved with and adapted to living alongside other species. The water bowl um, used to hide down its burrows, they have underwater burrows and if it was running away from a predator dive in the water head into its burrow hide and be safe so it can hide from you know things like 
Evans, Weasel, Stokes, Stokes, stuff. It's, it's stuff of similar size to itself, but that won't go in the water. And it can hide from otters, which are semi-aquatic and do hunt in the water, by disappearing down its burrow. But the American mink came along and it's much smaller than an otter and it can swim and it can dive underwater. So the, the female and the young mink, which are smaller in size than the male, follow the water voles into their burrows. So they've got no hiding place left. And that's why the populations were absolutely devastated. Because they, uh, the water voles have evolved no strategies for, for hiding, from, um, um, hiding from their predators, the mink. Um, invasive species can also carry diseases. Um, so we see things like I mean, the grey squirrel is an example there that carries parapox virus or the picture put there is the American signal crayfish which carries a crayfish plague and that's um, in areas where we've got native white clay crayfish um, the crayfish plague is a real serious threat to these rare native species of the white uh, crayfish and a lot of these non-natives compete with our native species so the ringneck parakeets I'm sure you've heard of these, they're, they're all over London, they're in a lot of the big parks in London, but they are also being seen in Edinburgh, there's quite populations in Glasgow, they are quite readily all over the place, um, and these compete particularly for um, nest sites, so they build quite big nests or they take the eels, they can use tree holes as well, so quite a lot of our species that are quite specific in where the nests are being outcompeted uh, for habitat as well as for food by some non-natives. And then we've got to start getting onto the things we don't really think about in terms of impacts like hybridization. Um, the seeker deer uh, down in the bottom corner is a very similar deer in terms of family and size to our red deer. And the seeker came in from um, Southeast Asia and they will interbreed with our red deer. So we're now getting, especially on the West Coast, there's an awful lot of these seeker deer living wild, uh, mixing with the red deer and interbreeding with them. So we're actually getting a loss of that kind of genetic diversity and we might get to the point where we, we never don't have any um, purebred red deer left which for one of our iconic Scottish species would be um, quite a horrific thing really. Um, the other impacts we see from these in, invasive non-native species are economic impacts so when we start thinking about the costs of um, invasives and what that actually means Japanese knotweed is the one that comes to mind here for everybody we know it damages buildings, it can devalue property values, um, it can grow, it doesn't grow through concrete, that's one of those myths that people put out there. If there is a crack in the concrete, the Japanese knotweed will use that crack and come up there through it, but it doesn't actually just burst its way through tarmac like um, some companies, I think companies probably <laughs> would make you believe. Well, I mean, as, as an industry, we spend, I think, in the, in the, that's GB figures, £165 million a year on managing Japanese knotweed and removing it, particularly from building sites, from housing plots and things like that. And crops and forestry um, damage is extremely costly due to invasive non-native species, particularly deer browsing, rabbits causing problems in agriculture. Um, it's one of the biggest costs um, for the forest industry as well is damaged by rabbits, by grey squirrels on timber. Um, so there's big, big costs there. And this thing we have called biofouling. Um, the picture of the propeller is covered in tiny little mussels, these little zebra mussels, which again are at quite a few sites in the north. They've been recorded in the Clyde. They are sneaking around these things and starting to appear. And they attach um, to anything. Um, uh, anything that's in the water, so sides of jetties, not a big issue, but on your propeller and particularly in water pipes, they've actually been known to block water pipes, so they're quite a, an issue for um, Scottish water, the water industry places like this. They're a really big problem on the lakes in America, um, but obviously if you're getting all your pipes, pipe work fouled and blocked, we're actually having to, I think quite a lot of money's been spent on filters already within Scotland to stop these things getting into pipes and systems and obviously impacts on tourism and recreation can have a value as well. And the overall figure there at the bottom, um, quite scary, £1.7 billion in Britain spent every year, every year, on controlling um, invasive non-native species. And the final impacts um, they can have, which are um, obviously quite scary, but easy to forget again, are of impacts directly to ourselves, to our health. Um, I'm sure you're all aware giant hogweed has a horrible phototoxic sap. Um, it contains chemicals that react with sunlight. 
So if you get it on your skin and it's a sunny day, the sunlight reacts with the chemical and causes quite horrific burns, quite serious um, blistering and burns on the skin. Um, that can carry on affecting you for, for quite a lot of years. I know a few people who've had quite nasty burns and you can get skin dermatitis and all sorts of skin conditions afterwards and continue to get reactions for years and years. So it's not a pleasant thing to deal with. Um, they can block access. A lot of the fishermen are always happy to help us control Japanese knotweed because it's stopping their access on the bank to actually get into the river that is starting to get overgrown so much. And the photo top right in the corner is two colleagues of mine in Perthshire and they're actually stood on a footpath and we had to turn, they literally turned around and walked into that giant um, Japanese knotweed which is completely dominating that area making it almost impossible to walk alongside the river there. Not just on land, of course, in the water as well. Um, that's actually a canal in the bottom left hand picture. Um, down here, it's, um, I, think it's, I think it's floating pennywort in that picture, which is um, an aquatic water weed. So literally blocking waterways for boats. There's no way a wee kayaker or someone could paddle through there. Um, so they do spoil our enjoyment of the countryside from an access point of view. And um, certainly I wouldn't be crossing that field there. That's full of um, giant hogweed if I came across that on my walk. So how did these things get here? Um, we've said they always have a human element to them. And there's four main pathways, what's called the introduction pathways of how invasive species arrived um, in Great Britain or moved around the world. Um, the first one is travel and trade, what we, we kind of refer to as hitchhikers. Um, things like the mussels can attach to the bottom of boat holes and nobody notices they're there, they're not cleaned off, they drop off, and particularly ballast water um, in big container ships. And the Chinese mitten crab is quite a small crab up there and that came in in ballast water, filling the tanks from one ocean and releasing the water into another ocean, causing species to move around the world. Cargo has become quite a big one, particularly organic materials, so timber, especially timber for garden furniture and things that's untreated. Um, plants, fruit and vegetables, the little harlequin ladybird there that came in on um, I think fresh cut flowers and vegetables from Europe across the channel um, and is established now and is I think it's a threat to our native ladybirds but not just um, commercial vehicles it can be as much as your own car to drive through the tunnel you know the, the European Euro tunnel what you picked up in France that's coming back across on the bottom of your car with you that you're unaware of and nature tourism and recreation is becoming um, quite a bigger thing. Um, people travelling the world, obviously, well, when we could travel the world pre-COVID, um, to go on holiday to nice sites. And of course, the sites a lot of people like ourselves on this group want to visit are the key tourism sites for nature. We want to go to these amazing places and amazing countries. And they're usually the, the, the sites that are most at risk from invasive species, where they've got rare species um, sites that are moving them between kind of nature key nature sites in different countries. And then we've got the species we brought here intentionally, um, and that went a bit wrong. So ones that were brought in for commercial use, um, to be farmed or for aquaculture. The, the American signal crayfish was brought thinking it would be a really good uh, food, um, like to eat crayfish. Um, I think, I believe, I've been told there was some in the River Nairn. Um, that a local chef deliberately put in there because he thought that'd be a really good place to have them and then when he wanted some to cook in his hotel he could just nip back and whip them out. Rather worrying. Um, Pacific oysters um, were grown in the aquaculture industry but they just kind of gradually, I don't know how an oyster when it doesn't really move can escape but they have. Um, I actually read an article in the news just a couple of days ago that Pacific oysters are now in every single estuary on the southern coast of Devon and Cornwall they've found these things and they're really starting to grow and take over and alter, alter the marine habitat down there. And then of course we've got our lovely American mink um, that I think everybody knows the story of that one that they were brought in for fur farming um, and a lot of escapes, a lot of deliberate releases, a lot of mink farms closing down and just letting the animals go wild. Um, it's actually believed that most of the mink populations came from, from, from escapes from the, the point the mink farms um, ran in the 40s. They think most of the, the ones that were released by activists and when fur farms closed, either perished quite quickly or were rounded up and shot. And the ones that we've actually got living wild are from some of the original escapes that just gradually happened over the years from the mink farms. But one of the, yeah, 
worst predators um, that we're now stuck with. And we've already mentioned, well, my mom and I were mentioning at the beginning, Fascula, New Zealand pygmy weed, or its other name is um, Australian stone Australian star on stone crop that are still being, uh, you know, are sold as being useful um, as oxygenating plants for ponds. Um, and there's still quite a lot, not crashing, but quite a lot of others still on sale today in garden centres that you can buy that actually want to go, ah, oh, don't put that in your pond. Um, and then we've got animals and pets. Quite a lot of species um, in the Victorian times when people had their large gardens, parklands, and wanted to show off um, all these wonderful species they had in their parklands. Things like the monk jack deer, um, grey squirrels, seeker deer, were all bought and put in the grand gardens of these stately homes. And of course, didn't stay in the gardens, they escaped and fed into the countryside. The ruddy duck um, is one, there was quite a lot of eradication work done in it about 30 years ago to, to try and get it out of Britain, Spain and France, uh, kind of big European push on this one. Um, and then I read recently the ruddy duck had actually been introduced to Slimbridge at the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust um, with its wings clipped and it wasn't meant to escape anywhere, but it did. So they were actually responsible bringing it in for a collection um, and letting it escape into Britain. Things like rainbow trout, non-native, but stocked in numerous fish, fishery trout centres um, across the country for people to, to actively go and fish. And I'm sure there's probably a little escape here and there. And then deliberate pet releases, because there's always things hitting the headlines of some of these snakes have been found lurking in a wood because people have just given up with their pets and they don't want them and they think it's okay to dump some goldfish into the country the ponds down the lane. Um, and that's what happened with the red-eared terrapin there. I don't know if uh, a lot of you remember, I'm sure it was your favourite TV show when we had the, um, oh, I can never get them right, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There was a big craze on television and they were styled on the red-eared terrapin. So these things were very, very widely available for sale in pet shops and everybody bought them for the kids going, yeah, yeah, I want my own ninja terrapin thing. Not realizing these terrapins live about 30 or 40 years and they grow bigger and bigger. And the little tank you bought doesn't fit it anymore when you can't be bothered with it and your kids got bored of it. Um, so these things are still turning up in the wild. We, we got one reported um, and photo sent to us last year from, um, uh, Dumfrieshire, uh, um, and I used to work in the country park in Ayrshire and we had a pair living in the pond that we, we um, yeah, used to put with numerous, numerous schemes to try and catch these things. We don't think they're established, um, I think it's too cold for them to breed here, but it's just long-lived individuals that from the 80s when they were released after that, that phase are still just living, so hopefully that one um, won't be a problem too much longer. But this is where you start wondering about climate change and changing temperatures and maybe they will be able to breed very soon. And then we've got the ornamental plants and we've got horticulture. Um, again, we think of the Victorians and we think of plant hunters, these people traveling the globe bringing back beautiful exotic things like Himalayan balsam and the, the, the want and the need of the Victorians to fill their houses and their glass houses and their gardens to show off the best and beautiful plants. And we also have a lot of garden escapees introduced um, that have literally escaped gardens. Um, and there's, I think <laughs> I blush because I have a few of these in my garden. I've got some nice wombrisha in my garden. Um, as long as it stays in your garden, that's fine. Um, Cottonest, Cottonista, wall Cottonista is quite a good one for creeping through fences and over walls and then growing in woodlands. And there's a lot of issues. And I think there's an issue that's growing about dumping garden waste. Um, people throwing out cuttings from the garden, chucking them over the back fence, thinking it's okay just to chuck them into the woodlands or down the bank behind the house, and then the establishing and the growing and the spreading. Obviously now we all have to pay for our garden wheelie bins, you sort of wonder how much more is going over the fence, because it's a difficult issue for people to afford to pay for someone to take it away instead. And we're talking both terrestrial and aquatic plants here, um, and lots of pond plants, as we said, that causing the problem have actually come out of ponds in people's gardens as well. One of the ones we deal with, um, American skunk cabbage, is one that's come, come out of garden ponds and we traced it into the woodland and back to someone's pond. So I thought, um, giving you guys a botany group, at this point I would digress a little bit from base species and talk a little bit more about um, the Victorian plant hunters and how some of these, this kind of era influenced what's, what's come into the country. It's not my specialty subject, so um, I'll give you a bit of an overview. Um, 
and we'll see how we get on. So we have this kind of what's known as the golden age of botany, the mid 18th and right through the 19th century, um, the kind of time of enlightenment and discovery when these big tall ships were heading out for the first time sailing around the world, discovering new countries, and with that an absolute bounty of, of new botanical discoveries and plants. And we also had in the early seven, mid 1700s, um, the likes of Carl Linnaeus, that I'm sure you've heard of, who came up with the taxonomic system of, of naming um, all the Latin names of plants in the systems. So the cataloguing of new plant species was very popular. We, we actually defined the kind of time of botany rather than just um, a mass of plants and things that grew. And initially it was, it was the, the kind of academics that traveled on the ships. So it was the ship's doctors and surgeons um, that were on these ships sailing around the world that started collecting the plants, usually looking for medicinal purpose plants, but starting to pick up anything or collect anything that looked interesting as well. And one of the first chaps that we really have to mention um, because he was a bit of a pioneer at the time it was Joseph Banks and he sailed with Captain Cook on the first voyage on HMS Endeavour um, mid, mid 1700s there to the South Pacific and he's credited with discovering these 1400 different species and all these species that he collected um, in various forms were sent back to Kew Gardens and he was also quite friendly with King George III who was the reigning king at that time and became advisor to King George um, on all these different plants, which was sent back to Kew. And really Joseph Banks is credited with making Kew one of the world's kind of leading botanic gardens. So just to digress onto Kew a little bit, it's not a place I've been, but the more I read about it, I really want to go there. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. Um, at the time of King George and, and Queen Charlotte, it was just an 11 acre small pleasure ground. Um, and Joseph Banks was sent, like I say, sent all the plants back and made quite a name for himself. Queen Charlotte in particular had quite an interest in botany and it became very trendy to sort out, um, seek out all these unusual plants and exotic flowers and want to add more. Um, and when he came up from set about after half a dozen voyages, Joseph Banks actually made, kind of made himself his own job and called himself superintendent of the gardens and made it his personal challenge to actually obtain as many of these new discoveries and plants as he could for the king and queen. And King George was the one who very much expanded Kew. He bought a lot more land around Kew Gardens um, and built a lot of the glass houses so we could house all these exotic specimens that were coming back. And then Banks employed um, another plant hunter, Francis Mason, who was a, a Scottish uh, lad who'd been a gardener um, at Kew for a few years, as actually employed him as a plant hunter go out and find all these new treasures. So here he is, this is Francis Mason, Masson, however we're calling him, um, and he went out on Captain Cook's second great voyage um, in the late 1700s around Africa and Cape Town and went around the Cape and he sent back a lot of species, um, a lot of Cape Heath species, succulents and quite a few bulbs that even ring a bell to me as a non-gardening non botanist of gladioli and gardenia. And the one that's a, a lovely plant, I think, the bird of paradise, not typically grown in Scotland, but quite a significant one. But all this plant hunting was a very dangerous business as well. There was a lot of ventures, a lot of stories told. Um, and Francis Masson was one who was um, captured by pirates at one point. He did a couple of voyages around Africa, then headed over to the Americas. And while sailing to North America, he was captured by some French pilots, um, pirates and they were actually scheduled for execution, all these lovely plant hunting chappies, but they were saved at the last minute by the French Navy. It all ended well in that case. Now, most of these chaps um, are Scottish. You've probably heard of David Douglas, very famous Scottish explorer. Um, by the time we hit David Douglas's first expedition was 1823, so we're into the early part of the 19th century now, and plant hunting had expanded, had taken off. Um, David Douglas was, employed as a plant hunter. Um, that has become such a big thing. He was employed by the Horticultural Society of London. And instead of just being on a ship that was out discovering, at this point we were actually sending out um, botanical expeditions, which was extremely costly to set up an expedition just for the purpose of going to find new species and new plants. Um, and he was known for his big conifers, so he, he discovered um, things like six spruce, grand fir, noble fir, Montre pine, Douglas fir, named after him. And they reckon um, the discovery of the Douglas fir alone was enough to fund and make the trip worthwhile. 
because it's become such an important um, agricultural tree in Scotland and in the UK. Just that discovery alone was enough to justify the, the thousands of pounds even in those days for the cost of the whole expedition. And like many adventurers, as I say, it's a dangerous business. He died quite young, age 35, um, and the story goes um, is when, he's caught, when he was in Hawaii um, on, on an expedition, he fell into a, a pit trap, to a deep pit that had been dug in the ground, trying to catch wild animals in it. And unfortunately for him, when he fell in it, there was already a bull that had been caught in it, which trampled him to death. It's all a little bit suspicious and alleged um, because he was on his own at the time, which was a bit unusual. And the last person to see him alive was um, a convict, a convicted felon. So there was a little bit of rumour and um, questioning whether this had actually been an accident or whether actually he'd been murdered, but we'll never know. Um, Robert Fortune um, was another Scottish botanist um, who went out in the mid, the mid 19th century. And he traveled extensively around China and Japan, um, areas that had been completely unexplored and introduced a lot of the kind of shrub species, a lot of roses, tree peonies, azaleas, chrysanthemums, um, and a lot that way. But he's got a very interesting story around him regarding tea. Um, and he was actually recruited um, by the East, in the East India Trading Company to go and smuggle tea out of China. In the mid 1800s, uh, middle of the Victorian era, we loved our tea. The Victorians loved drinking their tea, but the only tea being produced um, in the world was in China, and China were the only people growing tea and had the tea. <coughs> and this caused uh, the wonderful British Empire a little bit of a headache because China were forcing Great Britain to pay for the tea in solid silver, which Britain didn't like doing. India were trading for tea, but they were trading opium for tea. And the good old Brits were pretty worried that A, China was going to start growing their own <coughs> opium. So we'd have nothing, India would have nothing left to trade, and that they'd uh, basically holding Britain to ransom over the tea supply. So they actually recruited this botanist chap, Robert Fortune, to head to China, um, where he'd done a lot of exploring on the outer edges of China, to go and steal some viable tea plants and to steal the closely guarded secret tea production. And at that time, um, it was forbidden for foreigners to go into the interior of China. And if you were caught as a foreigner in the interior of China, it was immediate execution. So this chap really did risk his life um, in search of tea. And he did um, have very successful uh, missions on the, the front of finding tea. And um, his first exploration he found, he brought back 30,000 uh, tea seeds and sent them to India. And unfortunately, what happened is they all rotted in the journey and didn't survive. So he had to do another expedition um, to try and bring back live plants the second time. Come back to that in a minute. And the last chap to mention, um, another Scot, we've got some good Scottish explorers, is George Forrest. And a little bit more modern now, he was an explorer in the 20th century. So he started his first, um, his first journeys abroad in 1904 pretty much to the, the in, again, China and Tibet, up in the mountain ranges, unexplored areas. And he brought back a huge number, about 30,000 plant specimens, very much heading into the high valleys and finding a lot of shrubs on the big valley sides, um, the rhododendrons, camellias, buddleia, magnolia, and on the lower grassy plains, a lot of the smaller flowers that we're very familiar with today. Even I know these ones in my garden, anemones and gentians and apples and things. And the pictures there, um, so he's again a little bit more modern, so we have photographs of some of his expeditions, his campment there at the bottom of the valley. And the bottom photo, all those bundles that you see in the photo, that's his blotting paper. So they're all big bundles of blotting paper in presses in which they press the specimens to then ship them back. And it is a sexist world. It's the men that go exploring and the plant hunters. But there were a couple of women of note as well. It wasn't just all these Indiana Jones, James Bond types. Um, but of course, in Victorian times, it wasn't the done thing for women to be explorers and head out. But this English lady, Marianne North, um, is renowned within the field. She um, went out late 1800s, 1871, and initially to America and Canada. She spent eight months trekking in the Amazon alone um, and been around the world several times and then traveled Australasia. And she was an artist, very acceptable for a Victorian lady to do painting and art, so that was permitted. 
but she did a fantastic work of documenting hundreds and hundreds of plant species. Um, and her paintings were so scientifically accurate, um, they become vital botanical records. And what she used to do, like the, the, the photograph there is one of her paintings of a pitcher plant. And she is not just painting on a white background like most illustrators did. She liked to paint the, the species in the environment she found them. So she always painted the backdrop or the, the mountains or the woodland, um, the Amazon rainforest where the plants had actually been found. And her work was so significant, they actually built a whole gallery at Kew Gardens to house her illustrations, which I understand is still there today and has been the longest permanent exhibition um, of any female um, painter in the world, in, in Britain, I think. But it wasn't just the men. The women had an important role, one or two of them too. Now, we mentioned um, pressed flowers um, a bit there. And one of the big, big problems in terms of specimen collection, you can imagine back in these times, it was a three, four month voyage to, to travel between the countries we were exploring. So initially there was a lot of drawing and cataloging, detailed drawing of specimens um, as a way of recording what had been seen. Um, like we just mentioned with George Forrest, those huge amounts of blotting paper, were pre the, they were pressing flowers to great detail. I mean, that illustration there, it's, you know, pressed the leaves, the flowers, every single petal, the sepals, the stamens, every single element carefully pressed and recorded and that's what was sent back and I think those books and things are still on display in museums and in cute gardens today. But what our plant hunters really wanted to do was ship back live seeds and bulbs and live plants because that's what then could be grown um, back home in Britain, could be put in the glass houses, could be passed on to these Victorian homes and grown into beautiful plants in the gardens. But the difficulty was, of course, a limited amount of live material survived. They were packaged up in boxes and crates and put on the decks of ships. So these poor plants didn't have any light. Um, they were kind of exposed to the elements. They get an awful lot of sea salt and a lot of spray and saltiness on them. So hardly any of them survived. Quite harsh conditions. And there was a huge breakthrough um, by a chap called Nathaniel Ward, who invented something that was named after him called the Wardian case. And the Wardian case is basically a sealed glass case in which you grow your plants um, in. And he invented that in kind of the early 1800s and that absolutely revolutionised what could be transported around the world and what the plant hunters could send back. He, somebody, he was a very keen naturalist growing, and he lived in London and he grew quite a lot, well he was trying to grow plants in his backyard in London. But obviously as in Victorian times, a lot of factories, the air was very polluted and none of the plants survived. And he ha he'd also had a, a little glass jar that he'd put a, a moth pupa in it to watch it pupate. I'm sure we've all done that one time. And what he noticed is in this sealed jar, there was a little bit of soil in the bottom. And he noticed that a fern and a little grass seedling had survived and started growing in the bottom of this jar. And he experimented with that and realised that with a sealed atmosphere um, and the photosynthesis of the plant happening, the condensation collected on the glass and dropped back down again on the plant. So it kind of provided the water and almost watered the plant, as it were. So that you could actually preserve and grow things in this sealed um, environment. And he, he worked with a few friends um, to develop this, this Wardian case and James Hooker was the first one who really tested it in live conditions and shipped plants back from New Zealand all the way to England that survived the journey um, remarkably intact. So that absolutely revolutionised what these guys could send back and it did help our friend Robert Fortune, who was the chap trying to bring back the tea. He said he lost his first big shipment because it all went rotten. The second time he made his exploration into central China and stole all these tea plants, he stole 20,000 tea plants. No idea how you do that, you do that and steal 20,000 tea plants. Um, but he used these warding cases um, to put the tea plants in and ship them from Shanghai, uh, where he lived, to the Assam region in India. And so tea reached India interesting fact. But there's a bit of a shadow over plant collecting. Um, we kind of present it as this very romantic image of intrepid explorers and adventurers and these plant hunters were very much welcomed back as heroes. I mean I'm sure you're aware there's a lot of plant names named after these guys. They've all got you know David Douglas, Douglas Burr named after him. Um, Archibald Mengis who he, he, he collaborated with, it's in the Latin name, there's many, many plants that end in Latin names, from Douglas I, um, or after Forest I, after all these explorers. 
So they were welcomed home as heroes, but there's a kind of darker side to it as well, that all these guides and porters and locals who helped them were never recognised. Um, in fact, even worse than that, they, their own countries um, treated them as traitors for helping these foreigners and outsiders come into their countries and steal all their plants. All the plant collecting was completely unregulated, it was unplanned, and it was without doubt detrimental to the natural environment. It was destructive um, and there was a lot of irresponsible harvesting of plants went on. Um, people arrived, the stories of people, plant hunters arriving in valleys and literally stripping the valley clean, taking every single plant they could find. And even worse, there were some reported cases um, of particularly orchid hunters finding a rare species, an unrecorded species of orchid. And so, and because they wanted to obviously be the only ones who had that orchid, they actually felled the forests in the area so the orchid would never grow there again and they would have the only one. I think it's just heartbreaking really and, and horrendous. And as well as, of course, this destruction, we've also got unwanted plants that arrived back with the undesirable ones and all these non-native plants we've brought back, of course, we know now, had consequences. It wasn't realised at the time. Um, so we do have this shadow and a politically correct term now rather than plant hunting, it made me laugh, was the era of plant globalisation. It was an era when we had this international exchange of plants horticultural plants, agricultural plants, crops, herbs, spices, and the trees, particularly plantation trees. Um, it was, it was when you look, think about it, it was a, a magnificent era. It was, it was world changing. And there were benefits to that and costs. You know, we saw the establishment of the tea industry in, in India. Um, rubber industry was established in Southeast Asia, things like banana, coffee, um, cocoa, citrus fruits, plantations were set up around the world through these species being transported, which brought a lot of benefits um, socially to a lot of countries and a lot of, a lot of wealth. But again, as I said, it was a detriment to the natural environment. And there was a little bit of a, what, you know, um, thoughts that it's actually these wealthy nations that plundered and profited from the genetic diversity of other nations. And there are a couple of terms more recently in the 21st century thrown around of plant piracy and genetic piracy of, of this era of was it the right thing to do? But it was done and it's in the past, um, except it's not quite in the past because the consequences of this, um, a lot of these plant species that were brought back today um, in that we now know a lot of these have gone on to be invasive. And these are some of the ones, particularly in our project, we, we're dealing with all these species today that have gone rampant and out of control. Um, giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam, the three biggies, as it were, that everybody's familiar with and are spread extensively across Great Britain and causing horrendous problems everywhere. White buster bear we mentioned, that was the one that showed you a picture of the leaf earlier, and that's it in flower. American skunk cabbage, and one we're coming across more, more is Himalayan knotweed, which is a bit of a tongue twister in there, um, which is an annual but looks a bit more like uh, the knotweeds. But I think it's important that we don't just blame um, Georgians, the Victorians, um, this little graph, it's not very clear, but just so you get the gist of it, um, up the side of the graph is the number of species that we're establishing and across the bottom are years in 50 year blocks, going from 1500s up to 2000. So the ye yellow arrow I plonked on there is pretty much the Victorian times when um, about 200, 250 new, spe new species were established every year. And this is ones that have been established, so not just ones arriving, but ones that have succeeded in, in um, settling, breeding, uh, reproducing. But at the end of the graph there, to the year 2000, we are more than double that. So we can't just blame the Victorians' introductions as an ongoing issue, and we're introducing more and more species into Great Britain today than we have ever done in the past. Um, and the facts and the numbers are that every year, 10 to 12 new species become established in Britain. And of those, it's that rule of tens, again, 10% of those go on to become invasive. So that means every year in, within Britain, we're getting more than one new non-native invasive species, which I find a bit scary. The thought that we might have one new uh, hogweed every year, one new zebra mussel, one new Asian hornet, there's something new arriving and establishing here every single year. And that's just a consequence of our kind of ever connected global world that we all travel, we trade a lot more than has ever been in the past. 
So what can we do about it? Um, we can attempt management and control. Um, these are people in our project working. Uh, we can try and control these invasive species, but it is difficult. Um, it's expensive. It's labor intensive. It takes a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of commitment because most invasive species are quite stubborn. Giant hogweed, um, that top left hand corner is spraying giant hogweed. The seeds of hogweed will persist in the soil for about, I think about seven years. There's been cases and studies it can be longer. So you've got to go back and treat that site potentially for seven years before you get into the seed bank. Um, Japanese knotweed we're finding takes about two years, two or three years, but you'll get little saplings coming up till about five years. So you need to go back to the site for five years. Um, so it does take a lot of hard work and a lot of commitment. It's not something you can come and do quickly and easily, which is why the costs are so big as well. And as I mentioned before, it requires pesticide use quite often. Um, balsam we can pull up by hand, um, which is great. But again, it takes many, hard, many, many hands make light work when it comes to balsam because it's uh, quite an effort to do. And as I mentioned at the beginning for mink, we, we trap mink, we monitor for mink using those mink rafts and trapping. But it has to be done at a catchment scale as well. And that's why we're trying to work across such a big area of Scotland and working with all the fishery trusts. Because unless you start right at the top of a river, of a river and work your way downstream, there's no point clearing a little bit of balsam that's it in, in there. And if at the top of the river, the top of the bule or whatever, you've got more balsam growing because those seeds are just going to keep coming downstream and reinfecting the area you've just cleared. So it can be quite a demoralizing task as well and without a doubt prevention is better than cure um stopping these species getting here um is much better the bigger answer than um dealing with them once they're here if only we knew back then um so in terms of prevention there's a few things going on in terms of biosecurity um some of it's out with our control almost some of it's up to the airports and the, and the river ports to do which is to highlight at risk items um pork porks wasn't that hit uk radar quite a lot in the last few years because there's been a big outbreaks of african swine fever a disease that affects pigs so there's quite a lot of strict banning on bringing any pork products in and out of the uk now um and flagging up to people you know plants and seeds and wood you shouldn't be bringing them into great britain if you've ever been to i don't know how much people travel um i've been to new zealand a couple of times and they are hot on biosecurity at airports they make you take your walking boots out of your suitcase and clean them. They'll fine you if you try and bring an apple off the plane. You know, nothing gets past these guys. And that's why their, you know, their environments are still pristine and not, um, yeah, damaged like a lot of ours are. Biosecurity can also be um, species alerts. Um, I mentioned the Asian hornet in passing. I, I mentioned it the other day at a Ranger conference, actually, and a lot of people hadn't heard of it. Um, it's it's a nasty little hornet that kills our native bees and it started um, appearing about the last five years on the south coast of England so it's not surprising we haven't heard of it in Scotland because it at the moment is down there but hopefully if you live in, in the southeast coast of England you've heard of it because there's been a lot of publicity to get people looking out for it. Um, there's been quite a lot of sightings and this year is the first year they've had two nests so it has arrived and started to breed. I think it's come in on um, possibly on flowers um, and fruit and veg that have been shipped across the channel. And I think it possibly could have even just flown across the channel. It's been spreading through France and then spread to the Channel Islands. And yeah, the second nest was discovered last week. So this is that case of biosecurity being aware of what's coming and, and if they find a nest, get rid of it now before this thing becomes established. The other side of biosecurity is stopping um, what's here spreading further. We kind of stop the spread. Um, we mentioned Crashula, that little um, New Zealand pygmy weed, a tiny little weed. It's in the Caledonian Canal. Um, it's in a few places around Inverness, around there, around Mori. Um, you only need, I think it's five millimetres, you can grow into a new plant. So if you're a kayaker or an angler um, on the water, you get a bit of this core on your paddle, your buoyancy aid or your waders. And the next week you go to a different lock. It's very easy for it to drop off and just move from one lock to another. So there's a lot of campaigns like Check Clean Dry encouraging water users to check the gear to clean it and dry it off to make sure they're not moving these invasive plants or um, animals a little killer shrimp is the other one that can be moved quite easily from one water course to another but it's not just water um, keep it clean is a is a, um, a campaign by the forestry commission or sorry no who are they now forest and land scotland um, 
to try and encourage people to keep the gear clean, clean the boots, clean the bikes off so they don't move tree diseases um, from one woodland to another. And we've, we've got numerous diseases affecting trees now, uh, things like phytophthora that affect the larch trees and also affect juniper, quite a lot of the native species um, um, and a lot of beetles spread diseases. So we can all do a bit there. And there's another campaign called Be Plant Wise, encouraging gardeners um, to really think about what they're growing in the garden and try and pick the correct species, not put crassula or water oxygenating plants that might spread into the pond, choose native ones instead. Making sure if something is spreading out of your garden, you, you take the effort to go outside the fence and pull it out of the woods. As I mentioned before, composting, compost with care um, carefully to make sure we're not chucking things out in the compost that can spread as well. And the other thing folk can do and you can all do and help is to report what's been seen. Um, we take we take sightings on the plants we work on along the rivers within our project area, which covers, like, like I showed you at the beginning, the whole north of Scotland pretty much. And they can be reported on our website, invasivespecies.scot. We've got a couple of online forms there to fill in. Or report them any way that you normally report. If you normally report to your local records centre, you can send them invasive species sightings. Use I record or the new one, the new um, you know, on the block is I naturalist. They all end up in the same place as going to the MBN um, gateway, the MBN atlas, so they can be accessed. It's not always possible to act on these sightings. Um, as I say, usually people have quite specific projects, quite specific remits for what they work on, but it does all help with the planning of future invasive species projects and future management and things. So if you see it, do, do tell someone, do fill it on the form somewhere. I'm sure you're all great plant recorders. Don't leave out the invasive ones. And that's me. So thank you very much. I hope something, little bits and snippets in there have intrigued you all tonight. Um, same with my giant hogweed stick. Um, and any questions? I've prattled on quite a lot there. I think it's my button now to take my screen share down. Thank you very much, Vicky. That was absolutely brilliant and scary, <laughs> which was why I kind of I thought it would be good as a group of people who are out and about a lot to have more eyes and ears on the ground for not just plants, but any of the species um, that you see when you're out and about. So, um, I'll just I'll just start with one question. Are are there any of these species that we're winning at? You know, I'm just thinking rhododendrons. Well, I don't think we'll ever get rid of them. Um, but through the initiative, is there anything? Are, are we winning? On, I mean, if there's there are, one coming in a year, then are we getting rid of any? Well, I mean, there's things like that Asian hornet that we're keeping on top of. Um, I think it's the ones that aren't, but the ones that aren't very much established, we don't always hear about yet. Like. Um, um, the zebra mussel, you know, the, the, the alerts for these are small and less heard of. The stuff we're dealing with, balsam um, is easy to win at because it only takes about two years of pulling. The seeds are only viable with balsam for about 18 months in the soil and it's an annual. So once you've pulled it off, it's yeah. dead. Um, pull it for a second year, you look up the seed bank cleared. But there's such massive patches of it kind of higher upstream and in areas where you, you can't get to alongside a river. A lot of these are riparian plants. Um, we don't really feel like we're winning with that one sometimes. The one we are seeing really good positive results um, is Japanese knotweed. Um, Japanese knotweed, um, if you inject it, we, we use stem injections, so it's a bit like water crystals. We inject directly into the stem of the plant with pesticides to get the really direct control dose, which it gets taken down into the rhizome. And we're finding if they're treated for three years, um, we absolutely knock them back. And then sort of the third or fourth year, you just get these tiny little wee shoots that were a bit withered and really weak coming up. So we're seeing real progress in those patches. And because it's a rhizomous plant, it spreads from the rhizome. So when you've got a patch, you know, fragments can come back in from higher upstream, but it's more likely that you've actually succeeded and you're not going to get the infection so much on that side. So yeah, there's, there's places we're winning and we're, we're driving things. I mean, we won't eradicate, so that's not really a word we use an awful lot. Total control is what we like. 
um, and a lot of the fishery trusts have been doing this work for years, you know, that, and they've started at the top of the catchment on all the little berms and work really strategically. So we are pushing it down. And in some places, um, I mean, the, the um, I think the Mosset Burn, this one that's almost in the, the at forest, the Findhorn is almost down to the bay now, it's at the bridge at Pockabus. So the whole river system is clear. Um, and it's at the big road bridge, <laughs> and then you've got the estuary, which is just a mass of hogweed, which everybody's going, oh, don't want to get to that bit, you know, but the river has been cleared. So it's taken 10, 12 years work of the Fishery Trust before our project. Um, but the, there's a lot of work kind of going on quietly in the background. And the same with American mink. I think we've caught in the last four years about 400 mink. Um, we're not seeing numbers, we've seen numbers decline. It's very hard population size to judge American mink, but we're seeing water vol recover, recovery in areas. You know, we've seen populations come back, we're getting sightings reported, we're catching less and less mink and getting less and less signs. But the big question, of course, is project funding and what happens when our project finishes and can all our volunteers that look after all these rafts maintain the enthusiasm um, supported by the local fishery trust and hopefully that'll that'll keep going small wins but yes we're making some progress i, I feel the summer outing to pull up some plants coming yes. into the summer agenda surely as a, a group we could go out and pull some balsam um, pull some balsam from somewhere i'll make a note um any other questions Um, there's one on the chat box there. Do you have a poster or something I can share with neighbours throwing long brisha out? <laughs> yes. Um, we haven't got any posters as such. The, um, I don't think I've got any printed stuff. The, there's an organisation called uh, NNSS, another of these catchy titles, the Non-Native Species Secretariat, who are the UK body that deal with invasive species um, for DEFRA and a kind of and they lead on everything. So they're the ones that are running that plant-wise campaign with all the bits and pieces there. So I'm sure they have got some garden with care and compost with care leaflets and things like that. Um, so I can I can send a link to what I'm going to share or to Mari to forward. Um, I don't know if we're specifically mm -hmm. interested in that if, if you want to get some more leaflets to subtly drop on your neighbour's doorstep. <laughs> Whoever has asked in that, Sarah. Yeah, we can put something in the newsletter. So. Anyone else got any questions for the... Uh, you're, everyone's on mute, so Mary, Mary's got a question. On mute. You're on you, mute, Mary. You need, you need to unmute, Mary. Unmute. That's it. That's it now? Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed my morning with the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative pulling up balsam in the summer and oh, I would thoroughly you. recommend it. It was, it was very sociable and it was just great fun and the balsam doesn't require any effort so it just comes out really easily so you can just get on pulling it out and have a great chat and I really enjoyed it. It was great fun so thank you to your organisation and hopefully we'll maybe be able to have a botany group outing to pull up balsam. Yeah, I did yeah. it by the Conan on Dunglass Island. Oh, that's yeah. with, um, Excellent, yeah. yeah. The, the other plant I was wondering about was the last time I was in Harris, which was quite quite a number of years ago, I was quite shocked by the gunnera in all oh, the yeah. ditches. Has any progress yeah. been made eradicating the gunnera from the Harris ditches? No, I don't think so. I know Harris had a whole gunner project at one point um, and Nature Scott were leading about two or three years ago. They had a survey running on the Western Isles for people to report all the gunner so they could really assess the problem. I don't think after that it got further than a survey. Um, and this is the issue. It's, it's very difficult to get the funding to treat invasive species because it's just seen as pouring money down the drain quite a lot. Um, especially if you're just paying contractors to go out and treat it or control it. Mm. Most of our funding came because we are a volunteering project and we're trying to make a sustainable approach and um, you know, a huge amount of the work. We've had over a thousand volunteers like your good self, Mary, who've <laughs> come and got involved in the project or monitor mink rafts to try and set this up as a sustainable thing. And that was the kind of reasoning behind the big pot of funding we got for that. Um, 
<clears throat> so no, I, I don't know um, about Gunno. It, it's not one I'm involved with. But yeah, the last I heard, there was a big survey of it, but a oh, lot of talking God. and little action. Yeah. So well, I hope they managed to do something because it was certainly changing the landscape of Harris you know all the flowers that should have been in the ditches this horrible big yeah. green green leaves instead so hopefully they'll and get, the get their problem. act together the yes problems in the yeah. water flow as well mm. yeah another one to blame these plant hunters for <sighs> definitely <laughs> great any more we're all done oh well if there's no more questions um we'll just finish up and i'll just like to say a big thank you to vicky for coming along tonight this is 